Welcome to Open Access Week. This is our third, oh there it is. This is our third annual Open Access Week celebration and we have a lot of exciting things that we're going to present this week. Lots of events. Uh, we're going to have a keynote address today uh, that's going to be followed up by a hands-on workshop about mashup skills from the renowned Donald Duck meets Glenn Beck creator to a panel of experts about digital textbooks. As digital technology and content proliferate, questions about access, copyright, and fair use continue to come to the surface. This week's events offer lots of opportunities to explore these new areas of creativity, scholarship, and technology, and how they're all coming together. Let me give you a little preview of the week to come. On Monday, today, we have Hacking Pop Culture with Remix Video by Jonathan McIntosh, our keynote speaker for the week. Tuesday, RIP, Remix Manifesto, a movie here at the Gould Auditorium at 11 a, 11.30 a.m. How to Remix and Reuse, a workshop by Jonathan McIntosh, which will be in room 1008 at 1 p.m. That's tomorrow again. Wednesday, Free and Open Digital Textbooks, Perspectives on a Possible Future. That will be a panel discussion in room 1150 at 3 p.m. And on Thursday, our last event will be Publishing Smart, How to Make Your Article Visible, room 1009 at 2 p.m. Uh, and if you want to go back and look at any of this, you can find it on our marriottlibrary.wordpress.com site. I know you all memorize that really fast, so you got that. And there'll be, for our staff, announcements and continuing in Flash so you can figure out when you're supposed to come to what. And you're welcome to come to all of these events this week. So that introduction, let me turn it over to uh, Rob Gale, who's Assistant Professor of New Media in the Department of Communication, who will introduce our speaker today. Well, thank you, Joyce. Uh, yes, I'm Rob Gale, I'm in the Department of Communication. Um, before I get started, I'd like to thank Joyce and Allison Moore and the folks in the library for making this possible, and also like to thank Bob Avery, who's the Chair of the Department of Communication, for helping sponsor uh, Jonathan, bringing him in. And uh, speaking of Jonathan McIntosh, he's a remix artist, uh, a self-proclaimed pop culture hacker. And if I guess if you press me and wanted me to explain what that means, I think of culture as something about day-to-day -day life. It's the life that we lead. It's a kind of our assumptions. It's what drives us. And so a lot of what we get about day-to-day -day life comes from the media. And therefore, if we want to think about new messages and we want to think about critiquing our culture, we have to tear apart media. We have to critique it, mash it up, do interesting remix things. And that's exactly what uh, Jonathan does. He's got a lot of uh, excellent work out there. I want to highlight a couple of my favorites. Uh, his video, Buffy vs. Edward Twilight Remixed, is a masterpiece that, in his words, serves as a metaphor for the ongoing battle between two opposing visions of gender roles in the 21st century. It mixes Buffy the Vampire Slayer, of course, with Twilight. And if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, there's a little bit of Harry Potter in there. Just a touch. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, in the video, Edward's obsessive stalking behavior, which apparently is acceptable in Twilight, uh, grates against and is over, ultimately overcome by the tenacious and self-assured Buffy. You know, says Buffy, being stalked isn't really a turn-on for girls. Buffy ultimately has enough. Spoiler alert. Cover your ears if you must. Buffy slays Edward. <laughs> in right-wing radio duck, Macintosh uses depression-era Donald Duck cartoons to try to understand the popularity of shock jock Glenn Beck, especially in our current ailing economy. Donald Duck, who cannot find a job and has his home foreclosed on, wonders why he's in such dire economic straits. Then on the radio, we hear three, two, one, Beck. Glenn Beck promises to give Donald all the answers, but only after he shills out the money for Insider Extreme. In the end, Donald gets disillusioned, and he eventually overcomes Beck's racist and divisive rhetoric. For his part, Glenn Beck has responded to this video, calling, uh, and I think we'll see an example of that, calling Macintosh's work, quote, incredible propaganda. If we follow Glenn Beck's logic, uh, what you're in store for today is uh, a talk from a long-haired anti-American communist pinko hippie radical with funding from socialists like Obama or possibly ACORN or maybe Mexican narco-terrorists. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, listen well, dear audience. That is, if you think the terrorists should win, you like communism, and you hate America. Um, now, in all seriousness, Jonathan McIntosh is a true artist who's keyed on um, what art can be in the digital age. Art can critique, art can inspire, it can drive thought, it can expose the best and worst of our culture. It can bring together digital objects and mash them together to build metaphors and ideas. 
Art can change the world for the better. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan McIntosh. Uh, thank you, everyone. Is my microphone on? Is it working? Um, so that was a, that was basically my, my whole talk. I can just go home now. <laughs> um, uh, so this is an HTML5 web page, um, which you can find online uh, after the talk. Uh, but it's also a presentation. Um, you do need the latest uh, Firefox or Chrome browsers. It sort of will work in Safari, but only if you have like 5.1.1. Um, so let me just uh, start here. Um, like you said, I'm a pop culture hacker. I'm going to talk about what that means in a little bit. Um, I'm also not going to do a big introduction because I want to have um, somebody else do that uh, via video in a second. Um, but uh, this is me. Uh, so if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's Radical Bytes. Um, the hashtag that I'm going to use for just this room here um, is hashtag Remix Utah. If you want to um, participate in the larger discussion around Open Access Week, you can use hashtag uh, OA Week. And that will sort of link you into a larger conversation on Twitter. Um, my YouTube channel is Rebellious Pixels. Uh, and I have two websites. One of them is uh, rebelliouspixels.com. That's where all my, my video work uh, and writing is. Um, and then I also blog at a website called Political Remix Video, which is where we take, um, we, we take I think, interesting examples of politically oriented video from around, um, from around the web that, that mash up other content. Uh, and then we sort of write about it and blog about it. Um, it started as sort of an archiving project. Um, and it's still largely that, but um, there's sort of people engaging with it as well. Um, and when I say political for this talk, I'm, I'm, I don't necessarily mean government or elections. Uh, that's sort of big P politics. Um, but I, I actually mean it in a much broader sense, and that is to include race and um, sexuality, uh, gender, economy, uh, as well as policy. Um, so that's sort of a, w a wide ranging. Uh, sampling of, of, I think, some of the best uh, remix videos on the web that, that deal with um, remixing not just the footage, but actually remixing the message of, of mass media often, too. So, um, so to start with, um, I like to start with this first quote here. Uh, the universe is made of stories, not of atoms. Um, what that means to me is that the way that we sort of understand our world, the way that we understand our place in it, the way that we understand the relationships between people and institutions, uh, between people and governments, between people and corporations, is often um, through the stories we are told and the stories we tell. Right? Um, these narratives come in many forms. Uh, and often, uh, in, in today's day and age, uh, those narratives, the popular narratives, are, are inside of popular culture. Right? Um, so that's TV, that's movies, that's, um, that is music videos, that's mainstream news. Um, and that's where these sort of narratives are told and then retold uh, and then changed and transformed. Um, uh, now, that space, that pop culture space, is of course owned by a very, very small, owned and controlled by a very, very small group of, of, of corporate interests. Uh, and one of the things that means is that the uh, majority of, of, of these stories that we are engaging with have a very, I think, limiting and limited um, set of values, uh, a set of myths, a uh, set, set of social norms um, that they present to us. Right? It's actually a very narrow set of ideas on race, on gender, on, on economics, um, on sexuality. Right? Um, and so for many people, uh, they, don't get, they don't get to see themselves reflected or their lives reflected in mass media to a, to a very large degree. Um, and so what people have done uh, for the past several decades, actually, is they've taken those pop culture stories, whether it be a TV show or the news, uh, and they have remixed them or changed them in some way to make them better represent or better reflect where they're coming from, right? Because they might not be... Uh, they might not be represented. One of my favorite examples of this is Star Trek, uh, which, is a, which is a very popular uh, 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 set of stories in, in our culture, especially in, in, in the West. Um, and one of, the, one of the striking things about it is that there have been, uh, I think, five, six, 
television series now, um, some of them lasting seven years each. There have been um, uh, over a dozen films, uh, and not, not, there's not one queer character, there's not one gay character, major character in, in that entire thing. So, um, so fans uh, of, of Star Trek might say, you know, I really like Star Trek, but it's missing something. Right? It's actually missing quite, quite a few things, and so people will take fan fiction and they'll rewrite it, and they'll, 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 they'll add things to that narrative story that's missing. So that's just one example. Um, so uh, how do people participate in this, in this, in this uh, culture, right? in, in this media culture? Uh, and one of the ways they do that is, is that they remix. Um, this quote, uh, I actually love this quote. I, I, this quote is, um, is from uh, the screenwriter for Rebel, Rebel Without a Cause. Um, any film is at the same time an expression of a writer and it is an offering to the audience to create their own film. Now, when Rebel Without a Cause came out, he didn't actually mean this literally. Uh, but with technology today, it can be taken literally, and I do take it literally. You can literally remake the film. Uh, you can literally rewrite the film. Um, and that is, I think, what many remixers are doing. Um, and then lastly, uh, I talk about myself as a pop culture hacker. And there's some confusion about this word, uh, hacking. Um, it often sort of brings to mind uh, not so nice things. Um, but I, I, I actually like uh, this uh, definition. This is Tim Pritlove with the Chaos Computer Club in Germany. Uh, and he says that ha the hacker approaches the world, breaks it apart to better understand how it works in order to figure out what can be done with it. Right? Um, and that's, that's the way that hackers as a, as a subculture have traditionally approached things. They have, they have um, approached a piece of technology or computer code, and, and they, have, they have said, I want to know how this works. Right? So they take it apart. And then they, then they say, well, you know, because it's built like this, it means that it can do these 10 things that Apple or Samsung didn't want you to do with it. Um, but it's possible. And so what, what they'll do is they'll make They'll push the technology to its limits. Right? They'll see what else can be done with it. Um, and so in that, in that sense, it's a, it's, a, it's a deconstruction, and then it's a reconstruction. Right? Um, and that's sort of what I do when I approach television or the movies. Uh, I think of it in terms of, you know, he, here's this thing that I'm given on this face value, um, a story, uh, um, a narrative, a visual representation. And, I can take it apart. I can see how it works. You know, I can literally, I can literally take it apart, as well as as um, as, as sort of deconstruct it. Right? Um, find out what the embedded myths are. Find out what the um, what the uh, the embedded messages might be. Find out what the value system of that piece of media is. Um, and then I can, once I have it broken down in its components, I can I can then say, okay, well, because it works like this, because these are, this is the way that, it, that it's built, this is what drives this, this narrative, I can put it back together in a different way. I can transform it right, and tell a different story with these parts. Um, and so that's what ha uh, pop culture hacking means to me. I mean, I, I use that because I think it's, it's actually a little bit more descriptive uh, of, of a term than remix or mashup. Um, I use those terms as well, uh, and I think those, those, uh, that work is very important. Um, and, and often fantastic in, in terms of, of adding to a larger debate. But um, it's not just about often, the stuff that I find most interesting and most meaningful uh, and most poignant is not just about taking two things and sticking them together and to see what happens. Sometimes it is that, but often uh, there's a lot of thought that goes into it. It's a very intentional process of, of seeing what it is that's in the meaning of this message in this piece of media and what's the meaning of this message in this piece of media and then putting them together, right? Um, uh, removing certain parts, adding certain parts to say, say something different. And I think that that actually um, is more than just sort of sticking things together to see what happens. Um, and incidentally, I think that most people who do remix work actually do a lot more of that intentional and careful analytical process. Uh, it's not just taking things and sticking them together. Um, so. Um, I thought that I would show you an example of this uh, uh, using my own work. I, I made this video, um, Right Wing Radio Duck. Uh, it took about three months. Um, it's about seven minutes long. So it's, it's the same length as most Disney cartoons. 
uh, classic era cartoons. Um, it uses over 50 Donald Duck cartoons, um, as well as some Mickey Mouse and some Goofy that are thrown in there. Um, it also uses uh, about, about 50 episodes of Glenn Beck's radio and TV show, um, cut up. Uh, so this is, this is the version on YouTube, but I'm actually going to show you a different version of this. Um, it's actually the same video, but um, it's HTML5. And with HTML5, uh, video becomes an element uh, in, in a web page um, that can interact with data. Uh, and so uh, I find that personally a very geeky and fascinating. Um, so uh, the way that, that this, this demo works is that you've got the video playing as an HTML5 video. What that means is that the video element and the time code of that element can be, uh, can be, can trigger events. In, in this case, it's JavaScript events. So what, I, what I've done is I've inputted, I've input all of the footage that I used, all of the episodes of of, uh, of the classic cartoons, all of the episodes of Glenn Beck's show, um, as well as some footnotes that, that I have that I was using in the creation of this process, uh, and then some Wikipedia articles that deal with the specific topic that I was trying to get at, right? So it's adding this sort of layer of metadata on top of, of, a, of a piece of video. Um, uh, incidentally, the, the red uh, text are links. So if you want to see either the Donald Duck cartoon or the Glenn Beck episode in its original context, you can click on that, and it'll take you to the original source. So you can see it. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this. Uh, and this is an HTML5 uh, web page using the video tag, which is a new, a new tag. Uh, so the, for those of you who have already seen this, you can then watch the, uh, the metadata that's dynamically appearing. For those of you who haven't seen it, then you can ignore the metadata or try to. It's a little bit. Do you feel like you're working harder and harder these days just to stay financially afloat while fat cats get richer and richer? It's not just a feeling, and you're not alone. The income gap between rich and poor in America is at an 80-year high. That's the largest differential since the period immediately preceding the Great Depression. <laughs> the haves are getting more, while the have-nots are getting less. Meanwhile, government isn't helping decades of rising inequality. <laughs> run out of jobs. My name is Glenn Beck. The bad news is just multiplying. Our economy is tanking. It doesn't show signs of improving. There are people losing jobs. Our government responds to uh, the problems with bailouts. And when you call them up and say, what are you doing? You don't get any response. They're not listening to you. Wall Street owns our government. How did we get here? I think a lot of people feel like they're alone and they just want to give up. I love my country. 
It is the shining example of a place where people work together in peace and friendship and worship God and make things better together. Well, the ideas that built America are being lost and perverted. Ask yourself this one question. How many Marxist, communist, anti-capitalist do you have around you on a daily basis? The truth is that you are the defender of liberty. Our situation is bad. There are Nazis in America, Nazis and communists. You have to think like a German Jew, 1934. Behind. 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 There is a perfect storm formulating, and it is here. We are entering a dangerous and scary time, America. The country will be washed with blood. These people don't mess around. They are taking you to a place to be slaughtered. Death camp. What planet have I landed on? It's like the damn planet of the apes. Did I slip through a wormhole in the middle of the night and this looks like America? We're in a dark, dark place. We've got some dark dudes coming our way. Black Panthers, Acorn, Reparations, the Welfare, Jeremiah Wright, Van Jones, Obama himself, Al Qaeda, Iran, Islamic Jihad, Terrorists, Venezuela, Immigration, Mexicans, the Refugee, Drug Lords, Hispanic groups, South America, Illegal Aliens, Mexico, Chinese, everyone is coming. The enemy is not only in the gates, they're inside the house. Hola, Mex America. It's like a pack of wild Cujos ripping up the flesh of the American people. <laughs> Drug lords. Illegal aliens. Mexico. They're going to start getting more and more violent. We have been tossed into boiling water. These people are cannibalizing us. Cannibalizing us. That's what Barack Obama is doing to the American people. I'm hoping that the guy with horns doesn't actually show up. <laughs> Everything is about to change to the extreme, the insider extreme. We invite you to join up for $9.95 a month. It's going to explain everything that is going on. Insider Extreme is up and on. Hello, you sick, twisted freak, and welcome to the extremist. Who are you? Isn't that a name of some stupid Disney car? You can ask any question. Yeah. Oh, sucks to be you, doesn't it? When you bought a house, you bet that you could pay it, that nothing would happen. It happened. You lost. Move on. Boo-hoo, cry me a river. Hey, I got an idea. Listen to this. Get a job! <laughs> Lazy slob that refuses to get off the couch and get a job. <laughs>
Thank you. Uh, so what I like about HTML5 is it allows you, it allows me as a, as a, as a filmmaker, as a remix artist, to um, present a very detailed set of, my, uh, sort of, of, of notes about my process. Um, it also allows you to connect back to the original sources, right? So one, 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 of, the, one of the principles of, of fair use, which I can go over very quickly uh, in a minute, um, that I always advocate is to cite your sources, right? So in the, in the same way that you would quote from, uh, from text, uh, if you're quoting from video to make a remix, you should cite that. Um, and so uh, occasionally on, on, on YouTube um, or on Vimeo, you'll see people who have, who have made a remix, and they've tried to cover up that fact because they think that it's maybe the logo that will get them in trouble. So if it's CNN, they'll, they'll try to cover up the logo or blur the logo. Um, but actually, uh, what I advocate people to do is I say, you know, leave that and, and say, you know, where you got it from. Um, what episode it is for? Because one, you're citing a source. You're saying I'm using this. It's it's fair use. Uh, and uh, if other people, other remixers or people who are watching your uh, your video are interested in the topic, they can go then find and look at those original sources. Um, and so this just sort of is, is a way for me to to present those up front. I'm um, to say, well, you know, if if you think that I was unfair to Glenn Beck, you can go and you can listen to those sound bites. Um, in, in, in their original context. I mean, one of the things that I tried to do, and one that was very important to me, was to keep um, both of these uh, cartoon characters uh, consistent with their, uh, with their media persona, right? So uh, I wanted to keep Donald Duck, Donald Duck. I didn't want Donald Duck to do things that Donald Duck wouldn't do. Um, uh, and so uh, obviously I'm actually using Donald Duck, so that becomes, um, it, it almost seems self-evident, but you can actually make Donald Duck do things that are very un-Donald Duck-like with Remix. Um, but I wanted to keep Donald Duck as Donald Duck. I wanted him to react to the situations uh, in the way that he might have done, um, sort of in a very hot-headed and a little bit overblown way, sort of fall for things very quickly and then realize that maybe he's been duped. These are all things that happen over and over and over again in, uh, in, in Donald Duck cartoons, um, uh, of which I'm, I'm a fan and I have watched, you know, I watched since I was very young. One of the only things I was allowed to watch in my very conservative household was, um, was Disney Channel. And so I watched all of these over and over again. I have sort of had them memorized. And so when I came to this project, I, uh, Donald Luck was the natural choice. Um, I also wanted to keep Glenn Beck uh, relatively consistent with his message. I, did, I didn't want, um, you know, it's, it's very easy to, um, it's very easy to make him say things that are sort of totally insane. Uh, he kind of says things that are totally insane once in a while anyway, but you can sort of, you can very easily take them out of context and, and make, them, make him sound like he's talking about you know, aliens from Mars, right? Um, that's not what I wanted to do. I actually wanted to keep his message relatively consistent. And that's, that's why the, um, uh, the links are there so you can follow it back. And I, I just wanted to pick out the themes of what he was saying, but keep his message consistent. Um, and then have the, have the two sort of interact in a way. So it, it, technically it's out of context, of course, because it's, you know, I removed the media clips and made something new. But uh, I tried to keep their, um, general persona uh, accurate um, in as much as, as, as you can. Um, so uh, this, I put this up, I, uh, I premiered this at the Open Video Conference in New York City. Uh, and I think I was on Friday maybe. And by Monday, um, it had already gone viral. And so it had, in the first week, it had about half a million views. Um, and it was on every political blog you think of, including Glenn Beck's blog. Um, uh, Roger Ebert tweeted about it, and he said everyone should watch it. Um, and, uh, and he put a little urgency in, the, in, in his tweet. He was like, you know, everyone should watch this before Disney takes it down. And so everyone went to watch it right away, which was, I, was, I appreciate it. He also blogged about it at the, at the Sun-Times. Um, the Washington Post called me, uh, and that was about the half million mark. And they said, uh, this, this is the Washington Post. And uh, we would like to talk to you about your little video which I thought was nice of them. Um, uh, New York Times did a story about it, uh, and it sort of ballooned from there. John Cusack tweeted about it. Um, uh, for some reason, Bill O'Reilly also tweeted about it. He tweeted the video. So I, I don't know if he'd seen it at that point or not, but <laughs> he didn't say anything about it. There's no commentary. It's just watch this, uh, which is odd to me. Maybe he's not in control of his own Twitter account. Um, but then, so then on Monday, someone sent me um, someone sent me this, uh, and this is a video clip of Glenn Beck on his radio show. Um, he has about, he, he did have five hours of, of uh, airtime to fill every day. Uh, now it's four because he's not on, on Fox every day. Um, so he's a lot of time, so I understand that he needs to fill that time, uh, and he decided to fill that time like this. 
Um, Donald Duck meets Glenn Beck. Now, this took some time, some talent, and some money. Cool. It's I've what, never, eight minutes? It is, yeah. It is, it is some of the best well-made propaganda I have ever seen. Um, but I just, wanna, I just, I just want to show you what was on his website. Hi. Um, so I'm going to have Glenn Beck introduce me in, in a more formal way. I didn't do that earlier. Um, and since he has so much time to fill, he reads my entire bio, uh, which is fantastic for me because now I don't have to do it. My name is Jonathan McIntosh. I'm a pop culture hacker, video remix artist, photographer, and new media teacher, consultant, and fair use activist. I also have worked on numerous media and social justice related projects in the United States and around the world. Mm. In my spare time, I help co-edit the blog Political Remix Video, and I am a member of the Open Video Alliance. Political Remix Video, my video uh, work remixes and transforms fa uh, fragments of mass media pop culture to tell alternative political, social, and cultural narratives. Basically, I'm a pop culture hacker, but instead of a computer code, I hack television. My political remixes appear online and also in film festivals and on community TV stations and new media conferences globally. Last year, I was a consultant for Remix America Online Project. Last summer, I also co-taught a two-week intensive workshop called the Fair Use Remix Institute with Chicago youth <laughs> using remix video as a media <laughs> literacy tool. If I'm not mistaken... Um, some of these remix uh, videos, um, it's very interesting. I believe get federal funding. I believe it was one, one of these things that he's involved in was one of the first to receive federal funding to he's just, help he's culture just understand culture. <laughs> We're looking Maybe. into the funding of this gentleman and the incredible propaganda against me like you've never seen using Disney and Disney cartoons. Of course, it's all fair use. So they can use Disney. Apparently, Disney doesn't have a problem with, um, no, with Donald Duck thing. cartoons now being remixed. Politicized. And politicized for the um, progressive left. I know a lot about Walt Disney. I know how much he hated the union bosses because he thought they were communists. What? Um, I know how much Disney hated the enemies of this country and the Constitution, namely the communists, the socialists, the union organizers, dare I say it, the progressives. But apparently they don't have a problem with this. I guess it's all fair use. And we'll find out if it's been federally funded, you know, as part of the stimulus package or one of those NEA packages that the White House is simultaneously involved in and anyway, not uh, involved. So he goes on to quote Gandhi uh, and play um, Indian music, and it's offensive. Anyway, um, so... It was fantastic because he proved pretty much every point that I was trying to make in that little response. Um, uh, incidentally, I still haven't got my check from Obama after all that work. Um, you know, I, obviously I made this in my living room in my spare time uh, over a period of three and a half months. Um, uh, I didn't get any funding for it. I haven't been paid for it since or, or then. Um, so, you know. Uh, and I, um, as far as I know, none of the projects I've worked on have gotten any stimulus money. As much as I would like to get some stimulus money, uh, it hasn't happened. Um, so he sort of, he sort of proves all, all my points there. Um, and so that, um, uh, you know, a, a bunch of people saw this, and it was, it was sort of talked about a little bit. But it, it, this response didn't go viral in the way the original video did. Um, however, um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the way that this sort of call and response remix and, and um, uh, transformative do, uh, dialogue happens uh, often uh, on the internet these days. Um, someone else, another remixer named iCat381, took Glenn Beck's response and took a Mickey Mouse video um, to make another response 
So this is, th this is a remixed response to Glenn Beck's response to my remix, which is a, remix, which is a response to Glenn Beck. Okay? Let's follow that. Um, and I actually think that this is even better than Glenn Beck responding in a lot of ways. There is a uh, story on um, Donald Duck meets Glenn Beck. It is some of the best propaganda against me, like you've never seen, using Disney and Disney cartoons. But I just want to, I just, if I'm not mistaken, some of these remix uh, videos, I believe, get federal funding. The Communists. The Socialists, the Union Organizers, Jonathan McIntosh, the Enemies, yet another unbelievable attack. But I guess it's all fair use, and it's okay because the truth shall set you free. You know, I, that is my, one of my favorite things ever. Um, the, this response also went viral. So it was sort of a, a week later, uh, this one was also posted on, on many of those, of those blogs. And my, my remix now has about a, a million and a half views, I think, um, and this one has about a million. So it's, uh, it's sort of gained a lot of popularity. Um, and I think there's very, very little that you can do with, with uh, um, that amount of sort of hyperbolic rhetoric that has very little basis in reality, except mix it with a cartoon. It seems to fit really nicely. Uh, and so, okay, so, so let's, let's, that's an example. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about fair use. You know, I, I, um, I'm not going to focus on it a lot because I feel like it's, it's been covered in, in many places and there's, there's, you know, there's an enormous amount of, of, of academic work done on this uh, topic. Um, but I just want to go over it very quickly uh, in terms of some of the questions that I asked myself. Um, so uh, in terms of fair use, some of the questions that I asked that I ask myself, and this is not all that fair use encompasses. This is just sort of the, the things that I, I, uh, I talk to remixers about. Right? So um, it, is, is the remix work transformative? Right? Um, that is, does it change and transform uh, the original into something new? Right? Uh, and is it distinguishable as something new? Um, is the remix work a commentary, a criticism, or a parody? Right? Um, now, it doesn't have to be a negative commentary. It can, be, it can be a celebration. That can be commentary. It can be an argument. That can be commentary. There are many ways that you can have commentary. But does it comment on, uh, on the source? Um, and then uh, one of the questions that is often asked in this, in this list of, of questions about fair use is how much is borrowed? There's no uh, set amount. There's no set amount in terms of words, letters. There's no set amount in terms of video footage or sound clips. Um, the, uh, the doctrine, the fair use doctrine, says that you, you can use as much as you need. Right? Purposely vague. Because what if you need, you know, you might need 10 seconds. You might need the entire thing but you might, but you then, of course, would have to transform it in a very significant way, right? Um, so there, there, is, there is no seven-second rule. There's no thirty-second rule. There's no two-paragraph rule. There's no rule at all. It is how much you need, and that, you know, is going to be determined um, by anyone who's sort of evaluating whether it's fair use or not. Um, and then the one of the other things that, that is often uh, that is often brought up is what is the effect on the original work's value, and that that's that's the market value. So. Um, when this has been sort of discussed in the, in the courts, what they mean by that is, you know, um, if someone watches my Donald Duck remix, do they no longer have to buy uh, or see any other Donald Duck cartoon? Right? H have I shown them everything? Clearly, I haven't. Um, I've showed them a few seconds of, of a very large body of work. Um, uh, and so 
I, and that actually I think is less important, at least in, in, in the court cases that I've looked at, it's less important. The most important factor is the first one, which is whether it's transformative or not. That is the most important thing. It has to be transformative. Um, incidentally, uh, there's no rule that says you can't make money off of it either. There's no rule that says it has to be non-commercial. You can do a fair use remix and you can make it commercial. Um, it probably uh, then a transformativeness is going to be incredibly important in that determination. Um, but there's no rule that says, I mean, if, if, you, if you have it not, not commercial, you might get a, um, a judge's leeway a little bit, but there's, there's no rule that says you have to. Um, I also love this quote from 1839. Works are of value only if they gave rise to better ones. Um, I, uh, this actually, he's a, he's a German national, uh, um, naturalist. He was uh, a natural scientist. Um, and uh, so they were sort of working on... Um, working in the sort of the same field as Darwin, right? I mean, so he's talking about scientific work here. Uh, but I think that the quote can be, can be appropriated to mean uh, art or media as well. Um, so that's just a very, very brief overview of, of fair use. If you have other questions, we can, we can chat about it. Uh, I'm happy to do that. But I think there's a more uh, interesting question that I want to bring up. And that is a question about the ethics of appropriation. Because I think that is a separate, a completely separate question, actually than the legal and fair use question. And it's a question that gets asked, I think, a little bit less. Um, there's a lot of focus in, um, especially in, in, in open access spaces like this one, uh, about the legality, right? It's all about the, the legality. Is it legal? Is it not legal? Well, there are lots of things that are legal that are not necessarily good, not necessarily ethical, I think. Um, and there are lots of things that are illegal that might be ethical, right? So I think that there's another question, sort of separate. So I want to separate this question very clearly from the fair use question. Um, so put that aside, and we'll talk about the ethics here for a second. So these are some of the questions that I asked when, I, when, I, when I'm going to remix a, uh, some piece of media. Right? So I asked, uh, you know, who owns uh, the source media and who's depicted in it? And so for uh, Disney, right, for instance, it's, it's owned by Disney, right? one of the largest multinational corporations, one of the richest in, in, in the world. Um, and so I, that's who owns that. Um, uh, in terms of Glenn Beck, there's a, 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 there's a variety of owners. Fox News is one owner. Um, and then Glenn Beck has a variety of his own companies that, that, that uh, and then there's a radio program as well, so it's, right, there's about three different owners there. But all, all of those are, are corporate entities, they're all relatively well to do, um, and so they, they occupy a position of power. Who's depicted, uh, obviously Donald Duck is a, is a cartoon, um, uh, and then in, in, in Glenn Beck's voice, that's, that's Glenn Beck. So those are very, very critical questions that I sort of ask, you know, who's in this media? Um, and then what are the values, what are the messages? I embedded in that source mat material, we talked about that in, in terms of, of, um, of Glenn Beck and Donald Duck, right? There's, I think, two separate sets of values. Um, some of them are contradictory, some of them line up very well in those two pieces of media, and so I tried to pull out those things, um, in including some of the racial stereotyping that was happening both in Glenn Beck's program and also uh, in, the, in the older Disney stuff. Um, and then uh, I think the, one of the most important things is what positions of privilege and power do they hold relative to me, right? Because when I remix something, I, I'm kind of looking in terms of, you know, where do I sit on the, on, on the, on the power scale, right? On the sort of social um, uh, power scales, right? Um, uh, where, where am I? Uh, and then where is this media that I'm mixing? Am I, am I looking up? And I, am I I'm remixing people who are in the public sphere, government officials, um, uh, corporate entities, right, celebrities, people who have a lot of money, or am I looking down in the social sphere, people who are, right, am I remixing people who are homeless or remixing people who are, you know, who, 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 who might be oppressed in various ways? Um, so I always ask those questions when I, um, when I re remix, and I try to always remix, especially if I'm being critical, I, I try to remix things that are above me in, in relatively in these sort of social sp spaces, right? Um, uh, that's not true across the board. Many remixers don't do that. Um, it's very easy to pick on people who are below you in, in, um, in, in power and privilege le levels. Um, it gets a quick laugh, uh, but I feel like it does some damage, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so that's what I keep in mind, uh, certainly not what everyone does. And these aren't, these aren't rules. These are just sort of things that I keep in mind. Um, uh, right, and this is a fantastic quote from Bell Hooks. It's one of my favorites um, that sort of talks about this. There, there, there's a... There, especially in activist spaces, but also in, in, in artist spaces and sometimes in music spaces as well, there's a tendency to um, try to be transgressive for transgressive sake, right? To try to be, um, uh, to try to sort of be, be against the grain or, or uh, because, for, for the sake of being rebellious, right? As opposed to thinking about what it is 
like, you know, I want to be rebellious for a purpose. And what is that purpose? What, what is that new message, right? Am I remixing just the material because I want to remix something and it's kind of trend, uh, sub sub subversive? Or do I want to remix the material for some reason some, and have some sort of message behind it? Um, so uh, some examples of, of, of that. So I think about it in terms of you know, artists or media makers are, um, are using this tool of remix uh, to, to say something. Um, and often, uh, when you talk about comedy, you talk about, you know, you can, comedy, uh, you, you, you can, you, you can you're, you're sort of throwing rocks as a comedian, right? You're throwing rocks, and you're seeing if it hits and it's, if, it's, if it's funny. Um, and so you can either throw rocks up, right, at people who are above you, in terms of wealth, in terms of um, uh, various hierarchies, or you can throw rocks that are down. Uh, and throwing rocks down is very easy. This is, this is an example of people who are throwing rocks up, some of these memes or some of these remixes here, um, at, 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 at more powerful people uh, and, more, and more powerful institutions. Um, and I think that these challenge those systems, right? They challenge the status quo. They challenge norms. Um, and I think uh, often in a very positive way, not always, um, there's certainly some, uh, there's some back and forth here, but I feel like they sort of, these ones sort of tend to. I don't know, how many of you uh, have recognized any of these, any of these images here? Just a couple of you. Um, so uh, just one of them, Gaddafi, he, um, when, he, when as the protests began in, uh, in February, he gave a speech uh, from a little car with an umbrella, right? And it was a very strange speech. Um, well, one of a series of very strange speeches that he gave at that point. And, uh, uh, and especially in, in the Arabic-speaking world, this image became a meme. You know, so people would make little YouTube videos of themselves with umbrellas, and it was this whole umbrella meme that those have spread. Um, uh, and, and then he did another one where he did another speech where he, where he said uh, that the protests for democracy were being controlled by the United States and Al-Qaeda with hallucinogenics that they had put in people's Nescafe. Right? And this is like a national speech that he gave. And this is what, that, so that was his reason. So Nescafe became this big thing. Like, you know, if you drink Nescafe, you'll freak out and try to overthrow the government. Um, and so that was, you know, another sort of meme that, that, that people pick, pick, picked up on. And, and again, they're, they are, they're, they're using this, this remix footage to sort of make fun of and try to disempower this very powerful figure. Um, uh, First World Problems is another meme. It's, a, it's an image macro that people will often <laughs> use this image or other ones, which then some of them are quite good. Uh, not all of them, obviously. There are, there are, there are gems. Um, this next one, Privilege Denying Dude. How many of you have heard of the Privilege Denying Dude? Uh, it's a meme. It's, it's actually quite brilliant. Um, Sort of, they found these, these these images of very smug-looking, you know, dot-com uh, uh, hipster kids, and they uh, uh, they would just write things that, that they had heard their male colleagues say about them, you know. Uh, so you know, you're, you, or, or that they that they had sort of not said but sort of meant, right? So um, your ideas sound so much better when I rephrase it, right? That's a, a classic one, I think. Um, and that got very popular as well. There was also backlash, I think, against it. It was pretty bad. Um, Hype, which was making fun of um, Obama's award-winning PR campaign to become president, um, actually won the um, Marketer of the Year for that campaign. So that uh, was sort of talking about that. Um, Tom Cruise uh, has, uh, gets no end of, uh, of being made fun of for various. Uh, this, I think, is the one where he's jumping on the couch with Oprah when he did that. Um, Anonymous, I feel like it's a bit of a mixed, a mixed bag. Sometimes they go after, um, uh, I think, and actually more recently they've been going after uh, dic dictators and systems of power. Um, they don't always do that, uh, but I feel like they've been sort of tending in that, in that way recently. Um, they also have, a, have an operation against child pornography, which they're trying to take down all the servers that host it, which I feel like is a positive thing. Um, uh, Bill O'Reilly had a brilliant freak out that people made into a dance remix uh, many times. <laughs> If you haven't seen it, it's, it's definitely not safe for work, but it's pretty funny. Um, and then this one is, um, uh, I think, I, I believe is Sarah Palin, constitutional scholar, which <laughs> is also very funny. Um, uh, so some of them tend to be a little sexist, and I think that you, you, know, you have to kind of sort through it and find the, find the good ones. Um, so, okay, so those are, those are throwing rocks up. These are throwing rocks down. How many of you sort of recognize these, any of these images or, or memes, right? Um, if you don't, great. Good, good for you. Don't, don't go looking for them. Um, uh, they're sort of all, you know, all things that were became very popular, or they, they were, they were sort of remix memes um, that tended to make fun of people. Um, uh, so, make fun of queer kids was a very, or gay kids was, was, was a very 
Um, it's a very popular thing to do. It's an kind of easy kick at people who are lower than you on the social scale, usually. Um, this, this next one is a, a show called Lazy Town. Well, you've heard of Lazy Town. It's a, it's a Nickelodeon show um, for kids. Um, this, this woman, this young girl is 12 uh, in, this, in this shot here. Um, and she sort of sings and dances and uh, um, is shot in Iceland. Uh, she became a meme because they, um, a bunch of people decided that she that they wanted to sexualize her, and so they put her in all kinds of horrible sexual uh, situations. Um, so, uh, uh, you've got the golden voice, which people sort of, some of them celebrated, but a lot of them I felt like made fun of. Um, and then it, you know, it goes down the line. Uh, incidentally, Obama's in both of these, right? He's in, he's in both, uh, because I, I, I feel like there are, there are different ways that you can critique power. One of them is to pick on his, on his race. One of them is to pick on his, on his political positions. Um, so. Uh, these are sort of questions that I ask myself. I ask myself, you know, um, what are the power relationships here, right? Um, and then who's the target and where do they sit? Um, and I, I, you know, I, I hope that this, you know, that these become popular and I hope that these don't. That's not always the case. Um, so uh, that's about 45 minutes. I want to leave some time for questions. I want to show you one quick thing before I go. Uh, this is um, HTML5 Remix video. Uh, for education. And so this is a project that I'm working on called the Gendered Advertising Remixer. Uh, and so this is the website that we sort of built for the, for the, for the demo. This is just sort of really a prototype. Um, this is the Flash version that we're working on. Uh, and this is the new HTML5 version without Flash. This is all HTML5. These are all videos that you can, that you can play with. Um, uh, and in, in remixing TV, whenever I look at TV, I'm always thinking, how could this be different? You know, what are the messages here? Uh, how could they be mixed up? What could be different, right? So, you know, when I go see a film, I might be, I might like certain aspects of the film. I might be disappointed with other aspects of the film. And so, in my mind, I start mixing things up, right? So, I might go to a, see, a, see a film, and I might like the cinematography, and I like, like the dialogue, but there's no women in the film, and so, which happens quite a lot. Uh, and so, I'll, I'll pretend, you know, I'll sort of in my mind switch out the actor for an actress and just see what that would do in my mind, right? What, 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 what would that change the story? Um, and so uh, it's a great way to watch Harry Potter, by the way. If you, if you switch Hermione and Harry in your mind as you watch, it becomes quite subversive. Um, anyway, so uh, this is, uh, you know, I was watching Nickelodeon and I was watching uh, Cartoon Network, and I noticed that the ads, um, it's not really something new, but the ads are, uh, are very segregated in terms of gender. And it's sort of, you know, you have one ad directed at boys and then another ad directed at girls and then boys and then girls and sort of staggers that way. Um, and they are incredibly specific in terms of the, uh, the sort of skill sets that are being taught, the values that are being taught, um, what it says about, you know, about what it, what it means to be female versus male in, 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 in the culture. And if you just look at the types of skills that are being uh, displayed here um, and, and, and the value sets. And then you ask yourself, like, you know, which kind of, um, what kind of, you know, what kind of careers might come out of this set of skills versus come out of that set of skills, right? You, you get diametrically opposed and very narrow uh, um, and stereotyped gender roles, right? So in, 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 in the girl's side, across the board, you know, there might be veterinarian. Like that might be the most sort of career-oriented thing. Everything else is being a mom, makeup, finding a husband, you know. Um, and the technology is all about shopping or finding a man, right? So if there is technology, it's shopping or finding a man. Uh, over over here, right? So, you, but you also have some some positive stuff, right? So when I talk to middle schoolers about this stuff, I you know I say, you know, what are the positive things? Well, there's cooperation, there's compassion, there's caregiving. There's lots of things that are that are positive here, um, not just negative. And then there are lots of things that are positive here. You know, um, confidence, being, uh, you know, being in control of your environment, building and creating, right? But there's also a lot of aggression, uh, an enormous amount of competition, and almost no cooperation whatsoever, right? And so what happens? Uh, you, you can kind of explain that to to youth. Uh, and you can kind of have a discussion about it, but I find it much more effective if you can let them do the deconstructing themselves and actually do it literally. And so, for instance, in this case, you can take a Polly Pocket airplane, for instance, and you can take the G.I. Joe command base. Um, and depending on how, how fast the connection is here, you can create your own mashup. Polly's jumbo jet flying high. It's a great big jet in the sky. Walk the runway. Yeah, we rock it. It's a fashion runway in the sky. 
like a jumbo jet comes with all this. You put it together. Other dolls each sold separately. Uh, and so not only is it sort of fun to play with, uh, and it sort of gets a lot of people to laugh, but you can, but it becomes really apparent, right? So you can, you can, you can swap them, and you can do the, you can do the reverse. The GI Joe Pit Mobile Headquarters converts into a massive battle station, always ready for action. GI Joe, are you in? You can join today at gijoe.com. Pit place that ticket and vehicle sold separate. Batteries not included. Adult assembly required. Ask the parent before going online. Um. These are just some of my favorites, and you know, there's about 400 possibilities here, just with this. Um, let's see, audio, and then uh, let's see, video. Let's do My Little Pony. Oh no, you know what we're gonna do? We're, we're gonna do video of Betty Spaghetti, which is very good, and then we'll do talk the Taco Trucks, and we'll hope that our internet can handle. New from the Taco Garage, Mod Machines, three sizes, one system. You can build up and customize your heavy-duty truck with tons of. All right, so this is this is this is a little bit slow, um, but I am going to show you this. So this is this is the Flash version. Um, which we built as well uh, for people who can't, or whose systems can't handle uh, HTML5. So we'll try to build it in Flash and see what happens. Uh, where's Betty Spaghetti? Here's Betty Spaghetti. Video, and then where's our Tonka trucks? Here we go as audio. And we'll see if this will work. Um, so I'm sorry, starting to build curriculum around this, right? Um, it's all fair use, it's all transformative. Um, Educational purposes is another uh, is another fair use. Well, it seems like our internet here is real slow. Anyway, you can go play with this because it's online. Uh, so if you go to uh, if you go to genderremixer.com, uh, you can play with it and you can make your own. And the, the cool thing about this one, let's see if it works. Uh. New from the Taka Garage, Mod Machines, three sizes, one system. You can build up and customize your heavy duty truck with tons of parts and drop the motor into any mod machine. Tonka Mod Machines, each so separate. That's Tonka Tough. Um, and so with the Flash version right now, we've had it set up so you can download that to your desktop, or you can send it directly to YouTube. Um, you can put it on your own YouTube channel. And so when, when youth um, are, are building things, and um, I think about this in terms, of, you know, in terms of remix, in terms of seeing the world as not just something that you're given, but something that you can make something out of. Um, and you can sort of talk back to this is this is this is one of one of the first stages, right? It's sort of a, a gateway, right? So you you start by making something in one of these applications, and then you can learn the tools to go and make things um, uh, on your own. Even if you you know when, when I when I've done this workshop before, even when uh, young people go home and don't necessarily make another remix, they're thinking in that way. Right? They've already they, they, they're they're going and they're watching television, and they're not watching in the same way. Right, they're watching it in terms of what they, what's behind it and how it's built and what maybe they could do with it. Um, and so even if they don't actually make something again, they, they, in terms of critical media literacy skills, um, they're starting to see that, that, that process and what's behind a lot of that, of that media. So uh, I think I'll stop here and we we'll can do questions. Um, and uh, I'm willing to stay for however long people want. Um, If you don't have questions, I'll just keep talking forever. <laughs> but. Uh, right now, there's a rewrite going on with the Obama White House of so copyright. Um, do you have any inkling as how that will change fair use and how it will impact what you're saying here today? Um, given his track record, I'm not hopeful. Um, uh, the Obama White House has been talked a good talk, and then when they got in there, they have been pretty much doing whatever the um, you know whatever the big media companies want uh, and trying to spin it. Um, the way that that a lot of the sort of fair use stuff is won and defended is by by uh, makers and lawyers and remixers who um, get together and challenge the stuff, um, and so. Uh, just last year, there's something called the DMCA, right, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, there's an exception for fair use, um, for educational purposes, and, and for, um, uh, for critical commentary, right, and for, uh, and every year, uh, or every time it comes up for review, the industry, uh, media industry tries to get those uh, exemptions rejected, 
and reduce or reject fair use. Um, and they come up with these ridiculous uh, schemes, you know, like, you, you can use a DVD if you, you know, if you film it with a digital camera off a screen in a dark room for 30, you know, like all this stuff, right? Which is not what fair use says, but they're, they're, they're trying to, to limit it. Um, and there have been some fantastic organizations, like an organization called the Organization for Transformative Works, who has been trying to change that. And last year, they actually won a great exception, um, which is sort of already in fair use, but it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, in the DMCA. And it's, it basically says that you're, Latin, you're now allowed to rip DVDs for fair use purposes. Before, you weren't allowed to do that, um, which is a little bit ridiculous. You, you would actually have to pirate the media to be legal. Right, because it, because you know, even though you could use the media in, in fair use, the act of decrypting the DVD was illegal. And so you couldn't get the footage to use in your classroom because you couldn't direct it. So, so people, what people would do is they would download off the internet because someone else had decrypted it. They had done the illegal thing. Right? That's obviously ridiculous. And, 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 the, and the court found that uh, they made an exemption to the DMCA last year saying, well, you know, if you're doing it for fair use, you can now decrypt the DVD. And that's also fair use. Um, so I feel like the fights that are happening are happening on, on, the, on, on the advocacy level. And I think that's where, you know, uh, that's where I have faith that things can change. I hope that's yeah. helpful. Uh, go for it. Right. Um, do you see video as the most educational media to be using or like interactive? Uh, for, for what purpose? For just educating the mass public. Uh, it certainly is a very popular one. I feel like, um, you know, when I, when I remix things, um, I do it because I want people to see it. And I want, uh, I, I want a large audience. I don't necessarily just want an audience that agrees with me already or is in my specific field, right? Um, and that's why I use popular culture because popular culture is this sort of shared language, right? Um, it's sort of a, a common point that we can come together and say, okay, well, we all understand this reference point. Now we can talk about what it means. Um, uh, traditionally, fine art video, for instance, hasn't done that. Fine art video has been um, created, uh, for the most part, for other artists and for galleries and for um, academics, right? And so um, what, I, what, I, what I like about video, especially pop culture video, is that it, it creates this, this, this space to have a conversation about some sort of very serious and I think deep issues. Um, you know, uh, I, uh, I, I also use video formats, I think most people do, video formats that are also understandable, right? So we all know what a trailer is, right? A trailer is actually a very abstract thing, right? It's, uh, in terms of filmmaking, it's not a narrative really. It's sort of a, it's, it's meant to give you the essence of what something might be. Right, in order to see if you want to watch the entire thing, right? That's an abstract concept. There's, and you might get out, like hints of narrative, but it's not a narrative. It's 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 abstract. Um, and the same way with with TV ads. TV ads are meant to give you an impression of a feeling that associates with with a brand. Usually, you know, they're usually not. This is cheap at this price. Buy it. It's better. It's cheaper than over here. Like that's not actually what most ads are. They're about they're 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 about uh, um, making a brand emotional. And so. Um, a lot of remixers will then use ads because ads are again an abstract form that people understand, right? And music video, we all understand what a music video is, right? Even though it's actually a very abstract thing. Um, uh, and so, uh, if you're using those vehicles, you know, like trailers and ads, right? That's 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 another way to to reach people that 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 you know maybe haven't been to um, a media criticism class, but do know what a trailer is, and now they know what a trailer looks like when it's you know, when it's uh, Richard Dreyfuss falling in love with Jaws, right? Which is a whole different thing. But it's, it, you know, it's, 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 it's inside of that, those frames, right? That, that, that vehicle frame and that abstract frame. But it's, it, it's a way to communicate those, those ideas to people, um, um, I think, in, in, in a much more populist way, right? Um, so I mean, does that sort of answer that question? I mean, I think that, I think that ed ed educators are sort of lagging behind in this field. I think that um, uh, certainly, you know, half the students in this building are on YouTube right now looking at video, um, either learning or laughing, or both. And uh, and I feel like once you come into this into the into the classroom, that should that should carry over. Video should become an integral part because it's it's part of the way people engage with the world, um, and it's increasingly the way that people engage with the internet as well. So. Are these videos ADA compliant? 
Um, it, that's a good question. Um, I, well, so here's what I do. Um, and it depends, actually. It, actually, that kind of means a lot of things. Um, what, I, I subtitle everything, first of all. So, um, and I use uh, Universal sub Subtitles, which is a free subtitle tool, um, to give captions. Um, those, those, those captions are in that program. Um, uh, then I use translation tools to let other people translate. So it sort of broadens the, 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 the reach. Um, in as much as YouTube is, then yes. In as much as YouTube isn't, then no. Right? So um, the infrastructure that people are using for a lot of this video work uh, right now is, uh, is sort of based on what these corporations have made available. Right? Um, YouTube uh, is working on it, so they say. They're working on a lot of things, so they say. Um, and they're trying to make it better. Um, they, so they, they, you know, they, they have, um, they have uh, their voice-to-text tools. I don't know if you've ever used them. They're not very good yet. Um, I, I find that, uh, that one, of the, one of the easiest things to, to do is to, to write a transcript. And this is something that, that I... Um, that I, that I advocate for in, in, with all my videos and with other people who do videos. You know, just make an, make an English transcript, uh, if, if it's in English, upload it to um, YouTube, uh, upload it to wherever the video is, so that, that at least that option is available. Um, and then uh, with HTML5, right, so I mean, these, these are HTML5 videos that are embedded um, here. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of, 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 of add-ons that you can work with, right? And so those are sort of very slowly being developed. I mean, for instance, this presentation will only work in, a, in two browsers, right, right now. There's, you know, it's not quite there yet. But the possibility for, 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 for having video be integrated in, I think, a much more accessible way does exist with HTML5, where it didn't exist, right? You're, you were stuck in YouTube before. Um, and like you saw with the, with the dynamic an 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 annotations happening, right, you, you, could, you, could, you can imagine that being done um, uh, with accessibility in mind, right, and building a whole app around that. Um, and so because this is all very experimental, you know, people are sort of just beginning to, uh, to, to, to play with that. But I mean, accessibility is, I think, for me, critical and is going to be critical for the web. And I know that YouTube, at least and Google, is, is, uh, at least says it's important to them. So. Uh, since you spent so much time with these videos, so I'll start by something you said yesterday when we were talking about loving the source. Can you talk a little bit more about that? For, for example, the Donald Duck thing, like, the first thing I'm struck by is that music takes me back to when I was like eight, because I watched the same things on the Disney Channel. There's, there's some nostalgia trip there. But you have to stare at these things for days. How do you do Months. it? Months. <laughs> yeah. Months. How do you do it? Uh, well, uh, so it's, it's um, there's sort of two traditions, I feel like, uh, and, and this is a whole other talk, but there's two, 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 two traditions um, of this sort of subversive remix video. One of them, and they both go back to the mid-70s, um, one of them is culture jamming, or media jamming. Uh, and that is a, 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 pr a practice of sort of ridiculing media through remix video. Right? So we can go back to uh, the Emergency Broadcast Network, or EBN. Right? Um, uh, we can go back to... Uh, a whole bunch of groups that were doing that kind of stuff. The video scratchers in the early 80s in, in the UK. Um, often the relationship that those media jammers have with media is entirely, um, is entirely negative, right? They are looking at media as a, as, as, as a brainwashing tool, mass, mass media, right? And that, and that therefore they're going to ridicule it, right? And I'm not saying that that work um, uh, there's a lot of fascinating stuff that goes on with that work, but that, that's one type of relationship. That is not necessarily the relationship that I have with all media. There's another tradition uh, called vidding, which goes back to 1975, which is fans pr primarily um, doing what is essentially fan fiction with video, um, um, using uh, music and using, um, and using uh, uh, clips from mostly TV shows, but increasingly some movies as well to create, you know, using the lyrics to change the meaning of the, of the visuals, the visuals to change the meaning of the lyrics and create a, a, a new sort of fan fiction style story that makes an argument or celebrates a character or does a character study or whatever. Um, and, that, and their um, relationship with their source is very different. 
Um, they are also transforming and appropriating media, um, and they have something to say about that media, but it's often a, a sort of very um, sympathetic relationship with their, with their, with their source. Um, the way that I approach it is I take a little bit from both, right? So typically one of my sources will be something I really enjoy. Um, I feel like if you're gonna spend you know, between three and six months on a project uh, watching this source footage every day, you probably don't wanna hate every minute of it, right? <laughs> Um, unless you're, you know, you're enjoy pain, you know, um, and so you know, I, so I did a remix where I remixed the show "So You Think You Can Dance" with the presidential debates from 2008. And let me tell you, I did not enjoy the time I spent with the presidential debates. Uh, it was excruciating and painful, and every minute of it, I, you know, I, I spent as much time with the transcript as I could because I didn't actually want to watch the video again. Um, but, uh, but then I mixed it with So You Think You Dance, which I actually is a show that I, that I, that I enjoy. Um, I feel it's a lot of constructive criticism, sort of a constructive criticism reality TV show model as opposed to the ridiculing making everyone cry model, which is the more of the X Factor kind of thing. So, um, uh, so it, uh, the, uh, the auditions are a little bit sketchy. But after the auditions, I feel like you know, So You Think You Dance is, is actually gets to a lot of, sort of feels very, it feels very different. And so I like that show. I also like the dances, and so I could like stop with McCain and, and Obama and go to so watch them dances, and you know, really, um, and, and enjoy my 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 process with, with with that source. And I was kind of a fan of that source. And so, uh, for for me, I, I really love aspects of one thing, and I really dislike aspects of something else. Um, but I think what that gets back to is the, is this idea that in the, in the United States, especially, we have this idea that you're, you 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 either love something or you hate something. Right? It's sort of like this, this, this rigid, dogmatic binary. Um, but I, I feel like when you're engaging with media, and when a lot of people are engaging with media that isn't made specifically for them, like I'm very lucky because most media is made specifically for me. Like literally, they have a picture of me in mind, right? A white, straight, middle class, uh, English speaking, American, you know. Um, uh, and so they're making it for me. Like Star Wars was made specifically for me. Mostly because most of the people who are making these things are me, right? I mean, they're they're exactly my age and exactly my you know everything. So um, uh, so I could sort of expect everything to be made for me. And so when it's not made for me, I get all annoyed, right? Um, uh, or I used to. Uh, and but if it's not made for you specifically, like if, if I happen to be uh, if I happen to be queer, then I'm, I will notice that it's not made for me. Um, I, I can still enjoy it. Right, uh, I probably will, probably do, but uh, find something missing, right? Uh, and so it, you know, and if you're coming from um, uh, from various other ethnic communities in the United States, you notice that media is not made for you. Um, and so often people what, what will do when they watch media is, is that, that they'll have a critical engagement, right? Just in sort of a casual critical en engagement, which which is that you can like some aspects of it and be critical of other aspects of it. Um, and what fans and, and 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 fan fiction often does is says, well, you know what? I really love the story, I really love the concept, I really love being on the spaceship or whatever, but it would be nice if there were some people who kind of were like me on that ship or, or people that I know. Um, and so uh, that's that relationship, right? It's, it's loving something but being critical at the same time and not having those things contradict. And I feel like um, when I approach my, my work, I try to come from that perspective. Yeah. Uh, what software do you use? Uh, well, that's a good question. I have a small list here, assuming the internet still works. Um, it might be, yeah. Uh, oh, no, it's very, it's just, it's just slow. Uh, so I have some of the tools up here on Political Remix Video. Um, uh, so I, I use these. These are mostly the free tools. Um, right now, in terms of like actual editing, uh, I'm using uh, Final Cut Pro. Um, but that is because there's no open source alternative uh, there will be as of December 19th. So December 19th, I will no longer be using, uh, I'll no longer be using Final Cut Pro, I'll be using Lightworks. Uh, and Lightworks is an open source professional video editor. Um, uh, for instance, the, 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 the King's Speech, which won the Academy Award, was edited using Lightworks. Um, the beta is available for uh, PC, and on December 19th, they, they promise, uh, it'll be available for Linux and Mac. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll move to that. Um, uh, I, I use these, these various tools to acquire media as well. Um, I, I get media from everywhere. I get media from, from YouTube, and I get media from, 
from BitTorrent, I get media from, you know, depending where, where I can get it. Uh, I rip DVDs, you know, all, all the, all, anywhere you can kind of get it. Um, uh, in some cases, you have to, you know, like for the, the Donald Duck one, there was one clip. There's a clip of the Ajax Employment Agency. And so if you don't know a lot about Di Dis Disney, you know, like Acme, the, the Acme Company, the Acme Corporation is this big Looney Tunes, like it literally is the only company in all of Looney Tunes. Well, in Disney, it's called Ajax. So it's the same concept. There's one company. Um, and so there's this, there's this great scene where, you know, there's a, the Ajax employment agency, and that was a piece of footage that I really wanted in, to use. However, that piece of footage only exists as filler footage between other cartoons uh, on the wonderful world of Disney television show aired in the 1970s, 1980s. So if you don't have that, and no DVD. Uh, so if you don't have that, uh, you can't do it. So I, I had to find someone who uh, was a collector and who was like an obsessive compulsive collector of Disney material, who had a recording uh, when the show aired in the mid 80s, I think, on, um, on the BBC in Manchester in the UK. And he had a videotape of it, and I was able to trade with him via a very long process, something else that he didn't have that was also very rare, uh, so that he would then make a DVD rip of that videotape and then, right? So there's a lot of software involved in all that stuff. Um, uh, but this is the main stuff that I use, and I'm going to, uh, my, 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 my workshop uh, tomorrow, I'll talk about it, I'll go over it. <laughs> on, your, on your list of topics, I see you have negative land there, and uh, negative land, as I recall, uh, about 10 years ago, got into a massive copyright battle with yes. the band U2. Yes. And um, my, my question is, when you talk about, about mocking higher power sectors, you are risking that uh, the, the richer, more powerful group will try to shut you down. Um, and my, my question is, have, have you, I mean, obviously, you're, you're attacking Disney, that's, <laughs> which, which is the corporation that has basically written the copyright laws as they exist in the United States right now. Um, so, so when you're advocating the use of this, of this remix, um, are you not also suggesting that people are not <clears throat> completely aware of all the power sectors may be asking for a lot of trouble. I mean, you could get into a lot of trouble doing this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes and no, I feel like. Um, some of the reasons why I say yes and no is because of the provisions in the DMCA. Um, so if, for instance, I was to remix Disney. First of all, Disney doesn't care so much about copyright, uh, strangely. Uh, they care a lot about trademark. Uh, and so uh, what they care about is whether I sell a t-shirt with Mickey Mouse on it and they don't get the profits. That's what they care about. Or that I put Disney on the side of my daycare center or something. That's what they care about. What they, they, but you can watch every single Disney cartoon from the golden era on YouTube that have been uploaded by whoever for free. Uh, and because I, I think that their, their reasoning in that is that this is just sort of more brand recognition and that's good. Um, so uh, I wasn't actually afraid of being sued by them for that reason. Uh, I, this is a non-commercial project, so I thought that was okay. I also have um, a lot of friends who are fair use lawyers, so I have that in my corner. Um, but even if I didn't, uh, what's the worst that could happen is, is that I'm not hosting the video, or most people are not hosting the video. I mean, I, I'm actually hosting the video, but most people aren't. Most people are getting Google to host the video, right? Um, and in the DMCA, the way that, that, it's, that it's worded is something called the safe harbors provision, which uh, basically protects um, YouTube or Vimeo or whatever the, the, the middleman is, right, from lawsuits. And so what will happen is if they uploaded something that um, you know, Nike or Disney didn't like, or Mattel didn't like, Mattel is notorious actually, um, didn't like, uh, they would send a, it would sort of all happen inside of YouTube's extrajudicial process inside of the DMCA safe harbor, which is, which is that I would upload something, uh, Disney would send a takedown message, not a notice, because it's not legal, it's extra legal, to Google, YouTube. They would then remove it under the safe harbor, harbor provision with no questions asked. Uh, if I wanted to get it back, I would have to s fill out a form that said, this, no, I think this is a fair use, and here's why, and it might come back. But I, again, I'm not ever being contacted, right, unless I actually file a, a counterclaim with Disney, right, which is, which is a whole different thing. It's all YouTube and YouTube system that's, that's, that's working. So I'm not actually going to be sued, right? Unless I took it and put it, uh, the actual video file on my thing, on my site, 
which people couldn't share, or you, you know, it'd be, it'd be a weird thing. Um, it has happened. Um, I think it's becoming, it, it's, it's pretty rare, and often it blows up in the face of the, of the media company, right? So it's, um, I feel like, you know, in terms of this one, uh, they just felt like, well, if we say, if we take it down, that's just going to make it more popular, and, <laughs> you know, we won't do that. So I, I feel like most media companies are, are pretty smart about it. Um, if it was a commercial uh, project, it would still be fair use, but that, 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 that might irk them a little bit, I, you know. Um, but I'm, I'm actually not concerned. I think there's very, you know, the worst that's going to happen to most people is their video is going to get taken down, you know, by YouTube and with no legal action taken. Um. Could you give an example of how you might describe a student assignment in a course where you wanted to uh, introduce them to new media, get them thinking about it, and actually doing some creating? Um, what that assignment would look like? Uh, I can I can I can just tell you about assignments that I've given, and that could be helpful maybe. Um, so one of the things that I've found, and this is this is true for um, for organizations that are trying to get people to engage with social media as well. I mean, if you're talking about remix specifically, which is mostly what I do, um, it's often really important to set the parameters for what you expect. Right? It's sort of the last thing you, that I think you want to do is say, go make a remix about anything using anything. Um, because often that, that's just so overwhelming, right? Um, I, I, what, what I often advocate for is to say, you know, here's a piece of media, or here's two pieces of media, or here's a, you know, a, a series of ads by Coca-Cola, or whatever it is. Um, and I want you to use them in some way to make a comment on them. But you, you keep, you know, you, 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 you want to allow enough creativity for there to be a lot of um, a lot of diversity in the response, but you also don't want to sort of allow for anything because that will be really overwhelming, I think. Um, and so often what I'll do, like, you know, in terms of the, of, of the remixing tool, right, um, there's, there's 800 possibilities, and they're all different possibilities, but it's within a very specific set of assignments. So it's like saying, you know, it's just saying swap the audio and the video from these two sets of sources and see what you get. Um, uh, and so you know, I, I, you, you can do this on, you know, on the web, or you could you could do a similar project, you know, using you know ads for cleaning products and tools, household, adult, you know, gendered stuff, and you could say swap the audio and the video. Um, there are uh, image macros is another thing that I that I often will use. Um, so there are all these sites that will allow you to, to upload a photograph, and then uh, each person can type a different sentence onto that, onto that, right. Um, and so it, it might be, uh, depending on what your image is and what your, what, your, what, your, what your topic is, like the privilege denying dude was about, um, was, was sort of about highlighting in a funny way uh, male privilege and the way that, that sort of manifests in the tech field especially. But it sort of you know, went into all kinds of directions. I mean, there, there was a, after, um, uh, after uh, the video Monster came out, which is a very sort of misogynist um, uh, video for uh, Mr. West's song, um, it, it, someone made a privilege denying dude of him and just sort of like swapped out, you know, right? So you're, you're then commenting on, you're using this, this larger meme to comment on a specific artist and a specific song. Um, and so um, often that kind of thing can, can, be, can be cool. It can be like, well, here's, a, here's an image macro where you can type text on top of something. It's about this sort of theme, but then find other, other characters that might work. So whether it's Tucker, Tucker, uh, Tucker Carlson was one of them that people used. Um, uh, uh, there was, a, there was a, a thing that happened with uh, Keith Oberman where he said some pretty sexist stuff and then refused to apologize for it. So people made one of him. You know, for that, that was up for a couple months. And so you know, it, the, the privilege denying dude meme became more than just, you know, it's, 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 very, it's very, very simple. It's, it's one image and two sentences right? and, in infinite combinations. But that's it. And then you can, you can swap out another image on the same theme with Two sentences, right? So it, it's just sort of constricting the possibilities. But in that constriction of possibilities, the creativity can become even more, uh, even more exciting, I think. So those are just some quick stuff. I, mean. I wondered how you landed here. You could start and come after AJ. No, I mean, you said you clearly know a lot about a lot of topics. So just, I know we're running. You mean my life story? You want to know how? <laughs> <laughs> AJ, AJ, 
No, I mean, what, so what field, or I don't know. Uh, so yeah, so um, so it's a, it's a long story. Uh, I'm gonna try to condense it. I tend to go on and on. So um, I uh, I I was homeschooled, um, and so um, for religious and military reasons, um, my family is very conservative, and and uh, which I'm not, but uh, they are, and um, and so I, I spent a lot of time playing as education. So my, in a very odd way, the reason I was being kept home was because of very, very fundamentalist religious um, beliefs. But the educational philosophy that my parents had was actually very progressive. Um, so it was sort of an unschooling process. And so um, a lot of that was sort of uh, facilitated or directed play, right? So a lot of Legos and a lot of audiobooks and a lot of you know a lot of projects that I could that I could sort of follow my own, my own interests. Um, and so uh, you know, I in that process of, of, um, of learning, learning was always fun for me. It was always about f finding things out and figuring things out. And you know, like, I mean, for me, researching the history of, 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 of the Disney animators at the studio was really kind of fun, because you know, I want to know what's, what's happening. And each thing I learn, I feel like it's, 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 it's a fun game, right? But I feel like that is a little bit unique to a very specific kind of homeschooling uh, philosophy and um, and so when I went when I did go to high school I, I went to a magnet art school in Baltimore City and um, and it was it was sort of a, it was a very uh, it was very structured but it was also uh, you know it was an art school so I was doing figure painting and drawing and I was do, I was really interested in 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 in, in artistic creation um, I went to I went to college I went to a school that had no grades no attendance records you know um, uh, there was no required courses. I mean, you could literally not go the entire semester, but then you wouldn't get any credits. I mean, the way that you got credits was that you presented your work, everything you'd done in every field that you were interested in for that entire year, and they gave you credits based on that or not. So 15 credits or zero credits. You still had to pay for it either way. Um, but you, um, that, was, that was sort of very high, it was very high pressure in a lot of ways, but it sort of let you self-direct. And so that was what I was interested in, in, in doing and figuring out. Um, there's also no majors at that school, um, the museum school in Boston. It's the museum school in Boston. Um, no majors, so you could bounce between disciplines. I mean, and the, the idea being that if you're, being, if you're creative or sort of artistic uh, in, 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 in your work, then you will just find whatever medium it is that best represents the idea that you're trying to get across. And so that's what we'd do. I'd be like, oh, you know, I, this, this idea would best work in animation. So I'll go and learn that next semester, you know, or whatever. Um, um, but it allowed me to learn technology in a way that I wouldn't have otherwise, which is that, you know, most of the time I just camped out in the Mac lab, and eventually they gave me a job there, and then because uh, I was just there all the time, and then uh, and and learned and taught applications that way, um, including video editing. Um, and then when the when the Warner Rock started, I was very upset and. Uh, I took the just recorded the TV ads and all and put them together into into remixes and that's sort of how that process happened and and, and in that process of, of 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 doing and learning you know I mean certainly there was no class on remix um, but doing and learning um, and figuring out well I want to put this on the internet but there's no YouTube you know 2003 what do you do uh, I guess you have to find a Kodak and then you have to find some software somewhere that will put it up and then you have to you know like get a server and like all that stuff and so I did all that stuff and um, and that's sort of how I've learned over time is by doing. I think that, is that helpful? Is that kind of what you meant? And then, then he invited me to come here. So <laughs> that's a short version. Yeah, I mean, you're all welcome to leave. Oh, by the way, I won't, I won't be there. <laughs> or, or talk or ask questions. I mean.